typical one or um, maybe an irrelevant one. We'll see. Only time will tell. Today, bright and early, 9 a.m. Eastern time, we are going to be discussing four-handed poker ranges and various strategic adjustments you should make because of that. Before we get started, though, you can download the white ranges. I made them for you, made them available. Go to pages.pokercoaching.com slash formats. As you see, here's the URL right down here. I'll give you all a few minutes to go and get those. You'll have to enter your email address, and then I think you'll just have access. Maybe, maybe we email it to you. I'm not exactly sure the process. But um, go get the ranges because, you know, while you can follow along here today, um, you might as well have the ranges for yourself. Louis Philippe said, good morning. Third place for $1,000 in an $11 tournament yesterday. Congrats. Nice score. Ooh, it's tough whenever you're playing those progress progressive bounty tournaments and you take third place because it means you missed out on a load of bounties. But, you know, what can you do? Third place isn't so bad. Especially whenever it's for 100 buy -ins. 100 buy is great. All right. So, I'll give you all a few more minutes to get your range charts downloaded. Um... One thing worth mentioning, four-handed ranges in the cutoff, say you're in the cutoff playing four-handed, you should actually be a little bit looser than if you're playing four-handed with at a six-handed table or at a nine-handed table. And that's because if you're playing nine-handed, when everyone folds to you in the cutoff, Presumably the players in the earlier positions are not folding pocket aces and pocket kings and pocket queens and ace-king and ace-queen. That means they're more likely folding junky hands, right? So if they're more likely to fold junky hands, that means everybody yet to act is just a little bit more likely to have a slightly stronger range, which means... Did I say it backwards already? Which means in turn you need to... Yeah, you need to raise a little bit tighter at a nine-handed table because the people yet to act probably have slightly stronger ranges. However, at a six-handed table or four-handed table, fewer people have folded junky hands before you, right? So that means you get to raise slightly looser. So that is definitely worth mentioning. How many tournaments per day do you think a pro needs to, to play to make up for variance? Well, per day is not really what you want to be asking yourself because obviously what is a day, right? A day could be a four-hour session or a day could be a 16-hour session, right? When I sit down to play online tournaments, on Sunday, it's the only day I play now, um, I'm usually playing something like 40 or 50 games, and I'm still having tons of variance. So uh, take it, take that for what it's worth. Also, it depends on the buy-in level, right, and the spread of buy-ins. For example, I've been playing anywhere between $50 games and $2,500 games. Obviously, the $2,500 games and the $600 games and the $1,000 games make way more of a difference to the bottom line than the $50 games, right? And there just aren't enough high-stakes games to go around. All right, let's see. In Miami, it's gorgeous. Yeah, well, hopefully we get back there at some point. You're beginning the 30-day challenge. Better late than never. Yeah, we have a 30-day challenge going on right now. You can go right up here, pokercoaching.com slash tournament challenge. You can sign up to Poker Coaching Premium for completely free, I think, for like a week. And then we'll give you half off the first month. And you can get access to the 30-day tournament challenge. The best way to get good at something is to go deep, study it, and really make a point to... Be dedicated to what you are learning. We discussed this in the last episode of Little Coffee. Commit or quit, right? A great way to commit is to do it frequently and often. And studying poker is a great thing to commit to because it will result in you getting very good at poker. All right. You have a day off. You can watch before your online session. Great. How do you counter loose passive styles in cash games? Just value bet a lot. If your opponents are really loose and they call it all sorts of garbage and they do a whole lot of checking, then... Value bet a lot. All right. I presume all of you have your range charts already. If you don't, don't worry. We'll leave the URL up. Okay. If you go to the range charts, I believe this is what you see. Mine may be a tiny bit different. This may be an older older document I'm working off of, and you all are not entirely sure. Anyway, let's discuss what you're going to have in front of you. Again, go to pages.pokercoaching.com slash formax to get these range charts for you. Okay. So these range charts we're giving you are implementable GTO ranges. Okay? Implementable GTO ranges. That's because they are close to the game theory optimal range without splitting the way you play each hand. For example, there will be many instances where the GTO range suggests playing a specific hand some portion of the time, like 33%, 
And in the implementable chart, if three hands like queen six, queen five, and queen four each get played 33%, we adjust that to make one hand played and the other two folded. Um, this will make the strategy a whole lot easier to use at the table in exchange for losing a teensy, 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 tiny bit of equity. It essentially doesn't matter. It's negligible. So let me show you what I mean. Take a look at this image right here. This is a range chart for some spot. I don't even know what spot it is. But in this scenario, this is what we're supposed to raise with from some position. This is what Pio Solver will give you or Munker Solver will give you if you go to play. So you see we have some of these hands that have a one, the hands that are bright yellow. These hands are played 100% of the time. This is some raising range from some position. So we're raising these hands in yellow 100% of the time. Then you have some hands like ace-queen offsuit you're raising 95% of the time. King-queen offsuit 85% of the time. Ace-jack offsuit 40% of the time. King-jack offsuit 10% of the time. So how are us humans supposed to account for the fact that you're supposed to only play these hands very, very rarely? Well, you can do all sorts of things that make it difficult to actually apply. Like you can have a timer on your computer that you know, all right, King Jack offsuit in this exact spot, I'm supposed to play at 10% of the time because uh, you know, you've know you memorized a million of these charts, which you know again, us humans aren't gonna do. But if you memorize all these charts, then you can say, all right, if the time timer on my second hand is between zero and six, I play this hand. If it's higher than six, I don't play it. Well, I hate to break it to you, but that's gonna be very difficult to implement. So what we do, let's take a look at these hands, right? You see King Jack offsuit's played 10% of the time. What we're gonna do is we're gonna play ace queen offsuit and king queen offsuit 100% of the time, and that's basically gonna account for that. So king jack offsuit, we're just gonna fold every time. King queen and ace queen, we're gonna play every time. Now we have a 55 and a 40, so jack nine suited and 10 nine suited. Maybe we just play jack nine suited every time, or just play 10 nine suited every time. You see pocket sevens, we play 70, pocket sixes, we play 50. Maybe we take um, like this ace four suited and never play it. And then we play pocket sixes every time. We don't play six five suited, don't play pocket fives. Um, you see ace jack off suit, king nine suited, ace eight suited. Maybe we just always play ace jack off suit and ignore these two, something like that. That's roughly how you go about making these implementable enough. Again, it's not perfect. If your opponents know exactly the adjustments you've made, they can do a little bit better than the GTO strategy against you. But the thing is, is they don't really know what you're doing and they're not gonna be able to adjust appropriately because no one knows that you're playing the ace jack offsuit every time, but not the king nine suited or whatever, okay? So that's what we mean by implementable charts. Post-flop, we also try to do this over at pokercoaching.com. Let me see if I can make this bigger. See post-flop strategy here? This is what Pio Solver will give you for post-flop strategy. It's a bit of a mess because you see, you're supposed to play, each color is a way you're supposed to play your hand. For example, pocket aces here, you're supposed to use a big bet 54% of the time, medium bet 31% of the time, and check 15% of the time. That is difficult to actually do in game. So we've devised a strategy that'll let you use an implementable strategy. It's not gonna be perfect again, it's gonna be slightly off GTO, but you can figure out the right play when you're playing, and you don't have to go through and memorize 100,000 charts. I've been working on my tournament course and I've been going through a lot of other people's content to see what all they are teaching, make sure I'm not missing anything, right? It turns out most of the other courses out there are basically telling you, get PioSolver, run 10,000 scenarios and memorize them. I hate to break it to you, but that is not how you get good at poker. And it's actually kind of disappointing that people are paying $1,500 or $2,000 for courses that, sh that basically tell them, download a solver and run it a million times and memorize it. But that is what a lot of people think you have to do, but it actually isn't. Now, again, I'm not gonna teach you to be the number one poker player in the world. Number one poker player in the world probably is actually memorizing 10,000 of these charts. But the vast majority of people who are crushing poker aren't actually going through memorizing these charts. They're learning the principles that come from these charts. Like for example, in this scenario, you see jacks and tens are checked every time, right? There's some reason that's happening. So realize that you can learn the principles that come from these charts without actually having to memorize the charts, and then you'll be pretty close to right the majority of the time. All right, so anyway, let's see. These charts I'm about to show you, again, get them at pokercoaching.com slash formax. They assume the action is folded to you unless it's otherwise stated. If there are razors or limpers in front of you, the charts no longer apply because the situation is different, right? These charts assume your opponents play the GTO strategy, which will rarely be the case. This is very important right here. These charts assume your opponents play well. Now you can make charts that presume your opponents make some sort of blunders. The thing is your opponents can make blunders in all sorts of ways. So you're gonna have to use a little bit of logic to exploit whatever your opponents do wrong. Someone just asked, what happens if your opponents um, you know, are loose and passive and call every raise? Well, stop bluffing. Like, duh, come on, right? If they're gonna call you every time, only value bet. Life's easy. 
So you want to make sure you are taking that into account, right? So if your opponents do make uh, play too tightly or too loosely, you should make significant adjustments. Okay, these charts are designed for cash games because that is what most poker, when we go back, I think is probably going to be. And it seems like those are very clearly being defined as four-handed games. Um, I just saw a photo from the Bicycle Casino, and they have a whole bunch of four-handed poker games set up. And that's important to realize that that is probably what we're going to be doing in the near future. I hear my baby screaming, so I'm going to go check on my baby. One second, everyone. Sorry. Thomas had his leg stuck in his crib, as if he tried to jump out of it, but he forgot that there were rails there. Okay. Okay, so these charts assume uh, no ante, so these are not for tournaments, and they assume 5% rake capped at 1.5 big blinds, which is typical for most 2-5 no-limit games. At lower stakes, rake is higher, which means you should probably play a little bit tighter. If you're playing a tournament with no rake, because you already paid the rake at the start of the tournament, if there's no rake in your games, then you should be playing a little bit looser. Um, if there's an ante in play, you should be playing a little bit looser, especially from the big blind. Okay? So for bet sizing, these charts assume a 2.5 big blind raise first in, RFI, from in position, and a 3 big blind raise from the small blind. Um, in position should be 3 betting to 8.5 big blinds, out of position to 10 big blinds. 4 bets are all to 25 big blinds, and 5 bets are all in. Okay? When the big blind faces a small blind limp, they should raise to 3.5 big blinds. And when the big blind faces a 3x raise, they should 3-bet to 9. These charts are for 100 big blinds deep. Don't know if that's clearly listed. I'll make sure that is done. Because that is how most cash games start. If you get deeper, well, things should change. Some of you are saying that the image is a little bit blurry on um, Twitch. Maybe you go to poker or youtube.com slash poker coaching. I hear it's a little bit better there. All right. Let's take a look at what we have here. Cutoff strategy. I'm going to do my best to zoom in, but I don't know if this is going to work so well. So here we have the cutoff strategy. This is what you should raise if everyone folds to you in the cutoff, to 2.5 big blinds. Okay? We're raising with all the pairs, suited aces, ace eight offsuit and better, king three suited and better. You see, it's just a good straight linear range. Nothing too fancy about this. Okay? You'll find that this is what you should usually raise from the cutoff roughly. Next. What happens when the button 3-bets you? Remember, the button's going to 3-bet to about eight, 7 or 8 big blinds. We are going to then 4-bet with pocket 10s and better, an ace-king for value, and then we're going to be 4-betting with queens, jacks, king-jack suited, king-10 suited, and ace-10 suited as a bluff. Okay? Some players, you may find you have to call off with ace-queen if you do 4-bet it. That said, if that's the case, you probably would rather call it instead. The calling hands are all these hands in blue that flop really well. Notice the, the calling range is very, very strong, right? And then we're folding out um, a lot of our range in this scenario because we are out of position and, you know, button three betting range should be reasonable. You certainly could defend a little bit looser if you felt inclined. I don't see a problem defending looser against most people, really. And if you are going to defend looser, what I would do is I would call king jack suited, ace ten suited, king 10 suited, and then 3-bet instead, something like ace 9 suited, king 9 suited, queen 9 suited. Roughly. Something like that I think would be fine. Um, again, if the 3-bet size was smaller, remember the 3-bet size in this scenario assumes a, an 8.5 3-bet. 3, 3 so if it went 2.5 then 8.5, you see you should play kind of tight. But if it goes 2.5, 6.5, well then now you can defend way wider, and you should be defending way wider, right? So you have to make sure you're using the um the proper the proper um uh, charts for exactly what you're looking at right 
As your opponents play differently, you should in turn play differently. So that's what we're doing in this scenario. Let's look at cutoff versus small blind three bet. So here we raise opponent three bets this in the small blind. As you see, we're three betting Jackson better for value and ace king suited. We're three betting ace jack offsuit, ace nine suited as a bluff. People always ask, well, which ones are you folding if they go if they re-raise you? Well, obviously the bad ones, right? It's always pretty clear. The hands up top are good. Your four betting goes for value. The hands over here are not good. Your four betting goes as a bluff. All right, then we're calling all these other otherwise good hands, and we are folding all the hands near the bottom of the range. You may say fold king queen offsuit to a three bet. Well, again, it went 2.5 and then 10. Is it 10 or 9? What, what are we going to here? Uh, yeah, 10. So if the opponent's going to 10, you should play pretty tightly. Again, if there's no rake in the game, you should defend a little bit more, well, a little bit wider. If um, you're playing with an ante in play, you should defend a little bit wider because there's more money in the pot. If the rake is bigger, you should defend even tighter than this because they're raking way more of the money, right? So as you see, this is what we're doing here. Not a whole lot of four betting though. I think a lot of people think they're supposed to be four betting a ton, but really you're just four betting the absolute best hands they can get it all in, and then a few bluffs. Same story against big blind, right? In this situation, we are just four betting the absolute nuts. Here, the big blind really shouldn't be three betting all that often, which is why we are in turn four betting very rarely. Again, using ace jack offsuit, ace three suited as bluffs, getting it in with the other hands, and um, you know another reasonably wide calling range. We have to assume people playing in the casinos early on will be a little bit more loose and aggressive because the nits will stay home. Well, maybe, we'll see. Some people are just going to want to gamble. And if that's the case, you need to presume they're going to be three betting you a little bit too often. If that's the case, you should adjust, right? We're going to be discussing adjustments soon. All right, here we have button raise first in, a little bit looser. You're going to find you get to play about 45-ish percent of hands or so. Why are we four bet bluffing with ace three suited instead of ace five suited? You was always told ace five suited is better to bluff. Why are we not in 1080? I don't know. How do I make it in 1080? Someone tell me how to do that. Maybe we can do it. Um, why are we not four betting this hand? Because this is what the solver says to do. I know it's not a great answer, but solver suggests using this hand as a bluff. Why? I don't know. Solver does a lot of semi-convoluted um, things. And again, this is probably an imp this is definitely an implementable spot, I can already tell you, where it's probably calling some and four betting some with all of these hands, probably like, I don't know, 10% of the time each, to the point that it just doesn't matter what you do. And really, you have to realize when you four bet here, we're four betting as a blocker. The difference between ace five and ace three is very, very negligible. Ziv, welcome. New premium member from Israel. Hello, hello. Greetings from New Zealand. Every, everyone's from everywhere. Hello, hello, hello. All right. But again, again, double cheeseburger. Did you not watch earlier where I said these were implementable strategies? As you see here, if we use, let's say, this chart, look, it's it's uh, playing ace-4 suited sometimes, ace-5 suited sometimes. It's playing 10-9 suited sometimes, jack-9 suited sometimes. We've made these implementable which means you're only playing one of these when it's 55-40. Just pick one and do it 100%. All right. So anyway, button versus cutoff raise. This is when you're on the button and the cutoff raises you. Here's what we should be doing. Again, you have to use a little bit of logic to figure out which ones you're bluffing, but you're three betting nines and better for value. Ace, queen, and better and king. Ace, queen, suited, king, ace, king for value. King, queen, suited, if we three bet this and get four bet, we're probably calling some portion of the time. Actually, let's take a look at what the opponent's doing. Um, cutoff versus button three bet. Yeah, you probably have to stick around with stuff like king queen suited. Queen jack suited probably folds though. Ace 10 offsuit is obviously a bluff. These offsuit hands are obviously bluffs. All these hands over here are obviously bluffs. So, one thing you're going to find is that in position, you are three betting very, 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 very polarized. It's very important to be polarized when you're three betting in position. Out of position, sometimes that changes, but definitely from in position. Next, here we have button versus small blind three bet. As you see, small four betting strategy again, because three small blind, um, you know, probably is going to be decently strong. Same thing against big blind. Both players should be decently strong. Um, you mentioned earlier you think the solver likes ace five suited. It definitely likes king five suited. If you look at the solver, for some reason that king five suited sticks out like a sore thumb all the time. Again, for everyone who's late, go download the charts and read the directions, please. Please read the directions. The directions are very important. I already sat here and read them out to you, but these are for specifically 
games where you're playing 100 big blinds deep, games where there is a 1.5 big blind rake, 5% rate capped at 1.5 big blinds, and no ante in play. That is what these charts are for. These charts are also specifically for when the action is folded to you. If there are limpers, the action was not folded to you. There are limpers. So that's a different scenario. And you're going to find that there is no optimal limping strategy. So if there is no optimal limping strategy, then you cannot have game theory optimal charts for limpers because no one should ever limp. So now you have to exploit whatever your opponent's doing wrong. If they're limping with a lot of garbage, obviously just raise them wide for value, depending on how they're going to play. If they're going to call every time, raise for value. If they're going to fold every time, raise with all sorts of stuff is a bluff, right? Please, please, please read the directions. When folded to means exactly they folded to you. All right, so you see uh, both these situations when you are on the button versus the big blind. You're defending pretty similarly. Um, it's actually almost exactly the same. And that's just because we are facing the rather big three bet size. Again, the three bet size is to um, 10 big blinds from out of position. So big three bet size. All right, small blind. In this situation, you see we have a really convoluted strategy. Small blind, raise first hand. So here we are raising the hands in red and we're limping the hands in blue. The purpose of this is to allow us to play a wide range. If you only raise your best hands and only limp your marginal and garbage hands, then you're not going to be able to play nearly as many hands. But if you instead mix it up like this, when your opponent, when you limp, your opponent doesn't know if you have a good hand that's going to limp call or limp re-raise, or if you have a bad hand that's going to limp and fold, which makes it to where they just can't raise you blindly. So, as you see here, we're using this strategy. Um, here we have small blind versus cutoff. We're just three betting very linear. Small blind versus button, three betting very linear. Then we have small blind versus cutoff, raise, and button three bet. You see we are four betting with just the absolute best hands. Four betting some of these as bluffs. Ace jack suited, king jack suited, king queen suited, ace queen off suit to fold to a jam. And then the rest will call it off against the jam. Okay. Again, notice here, small blind versus cutoff, small blind versus button. There is no flat calling range. There is no flat calling range. That means you are three betting literally every hand you play from the small blind. Okay? Any tips on how to beat the rake in, low, in small six games? Yeah, play the optimal strategy. Remember, these charts here assume that you're playing a standard-ish 2-5 no limit game with a regular rake. As the rake is higher, you should just play tighter. Small blind strategy doesn't seem very implementable. There are significant EV loss. Is there significant EV loss compared to only an open raise strategy? Oh yeah, if you only raise or fold from the small blind, you're just gonna be lighting your money on fire. Absolutely lighting your money on fire. You should definitely have a limping range. You must have a limping range from the small blind. Unless, of course, your opponent's really bad. Again, if your opponent's really bad, if your opponent's gonna fold every time you raise, unless they have the nuts, then obviously just raise a ton. The small blind is a spot where you should be adjusting the most because you're against exactly one player. As you're against fewer and fewer players, you should be adjust, adjusting more and more depending on whatever they do wrong. But no, this actually is relatively implementable, right? I mean, it's pretty obvious. Limp the absolute best, raise slightly worse, limp next, 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 raise slightly worse. It goes right down, right down the list. And then you see, notice how this breaks down. It's pretty obvious how this breaks down in this scenario. You see, Limp versus big blind raise, you're re-raising. Aces, ace, king, ace, queen suited, ace, jack suited, king, queen suited, tens and nines for value. And you're raising these hands, king, nine suited, queen, nine suited, jack, nine suited, ace, ten offsuit, ace, nine offsuit as a bluff. Okay? Um, then you're limping and then calling the raise with all these hands that flop pretty well, right? That makes logical sense. Then you're limping and folding with all these hands that don't flop very well. You may say limp, fold, ace, three offsuit. Again, that's because of the rake, right? Can you all see this? Hmm. Ah, here we go. Small blind rate when you raise versus a three bet, as you see, you're four betting your best hands plus that, that magical king five suited bluff, king jack off suit bluff. You're calling with these hands in blue, which are all very strong, and you're folding these hands, which are not quite as good, right? It's pretty logical. They're going to have lower rake to attract more players. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. We'll see. Some places are. Most casinos, if you're playing shorthanded, they give you half rake. But notice, that doesn't really help the casino because they're dealing roughly the same number of hands or, you know, 1.5 times as many hands. So casinos are going to be making less money. All right, here we have big blind strategy. Big blind versus cutoff. 
we are three betting these hands in red, calling all these hands in blue. Very, very wide calling range. You may say, notice that you're not defending anywhere nearly as wide as you would in a tournament. And that's because in a tournament, you're facing smaller raises and there's no rake. So you see in a tournament, you may get to play like, say you're playing 15 big blinds deep, you get to play like 90% of hands from the small, from the big blind. Here you only get to play about 45% of hands. Okay? Big blind versus button. You see a different composition of hands that you are three betting, which is kind of interesting. Also, you're playing more hands, so that's pretty neat. Here we have big blind versus small blind limp. Remember, when small blind limps, they should be very, um, well, they're going to have a mix, which is tough to play against. But you're usually just going to want to raise your best hands plus some bluffs. It's pretty obvious which ones the bluffs are, right? All these ones down here and down here, these are all bluffs. You're raising very polarized. You're going to find in position you want to be raising polarized. Um, big blind versus small blind raise, same story. You want to be very polarized when you're raising, which makes logical sense. And then we have spots where you're, you get to four bet. So big blind versus cutoff raise, button three bet, just super nitty. Big blind versus button raise, small blind three bet, a little bit wider, but still very nitty. So when it goes raise three bet, you need to be very tight. As you see, there is no calling range when it goes raise three bet. You instead um, four bet or bold everything. Okay? So look, those are the implementable game theory optimal charts. The question now becomes, how should you change your strategy to account for what your opponents are doing wrong. And that's very, very important to ask yourself because a lot of the time you should not be blindly following the generic game theory optimal charts. So if your opponents are raising too wide, you wanna ask how will they reply to additional aggression? Will they be loose or will they be tight to additional aggression? Some people will be very loose and they'll just four bet every time because they're lunatics. They think, okay, six handed, I need to be four betting a ton. James is outside. Um, other people will raise very wide and then assume that if you three bet, they only should call with the absolute best hands. So you wanna make sure that you are accounting to for whatever your opponent's doing correctly. Because some people can play the exact same amount of hands pre-flop. They can raise, let's say, I don't know, 60% of hands from the cutoff, which is way too wide. But some of them will four bet a ton and some of them will fold a ton. And your strategy depends a lot on which one of those they're gonna do. So you need to get in there and you need to experiment. Whenever you're playing shorthanded poker, you want to see what you can get away with. Remember, nine-handed poker, you really don't get to mess around all that much just because someone's going to have something at the table a lot of the time. But at four-handed poker, quite often, no one has anything. And if your opponents will let you win every pot where they don't have anything good, then it's really easy to play against them, right? You can just raise three-bet, four-bet, whatever, just apply a lot of aggression and put them in bad spots. Now, obviously, if a tight player who only plays good hands three-bets you or four-bets you, that's your sign to get out of the way. Don't be the fish who really tries to win every single pot. That is a big, big, big mistake. So is forehand or hyper exploitative? You know, that made me actually think back to a tournament that I won a while back on Poker Stars. I, I have it recorded. If you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, what's it called? I don't know. I'll try to find it on the side here. Um... website. But yeah, so you will always want to ask, what are the opponents doing incorrectly? Do we study with solvers? Of course we do. That said, we try to make these things implementable for you. It's very important to make sure that you use implementable strategies, which, you know, you can't really get all that more implementable than a just straight up chart for you to look at and for you to copy. Okay, which is what we have here for you. It's very, very important to find ways to just very easily and simply play well. And that's what we have. I'm trying to find this uh, course that I have playing four-handed tournaments, which actually, you know, somehow may become pretty timely. Who knows how I played back then? I'm sure I was an absolute lunatic. There's so many courses on poker coaching. Goodness gracious. Too many courses, everyone. Sorry. Let's see. It's somewhere in here. It's one of these about exploit. Ex Let me just look up exploit. I'm sure that'll come up. Obviously, it doesn't. Louis Fleet probably knows which one it is. 
<laughs> anyway, it's somewhere in there. If not, send us an email, we'll find it. Whatever, okay. How's quarantine poker gone for you? It's been fine. Did I see the video that the shill Boisky said? Uh, yeah, shills are gonna shill. It's important to realize that if someone's paying you to promote them, they are going to do things like that to um, try to earn their keep. Funny enough, so Boisky was paid, I, I was told $100 to make that video to try to um, demean me because the same rakeback company that paid him $100 came to me and said, hey, Jonathan, will you, can we pay you $100 to make a video of you trying to tear down Boisky using these points? They were trying to cause drama, and they were trying to stir the pot. And obviously that's asinine. Jonathan Little is not, certainly not going to make a video about someone he's never interacted with in his whole life trying to tear a random person down for $100. I mean, how big of a loser do you have to be to do this? And hate to break it to you all, we're not shilling for sites that are operating illegally. And we're also... Certainly not going to be making videos talking trash about people who we don't even know. That would be ridiculous. So, um, yeah. So anyone told me I look like Murr from Impractical Jokers. No, I've not been told that. Um, my parents do love that show, though. You love the Faraz Jocko stream yesterday. Great, I'm glad to hear it. Yesterday, Faraz Jocko live streamed for Poker Coaching Premium members. We're trying to do more things to just continuously add value to Poker Coaching, and um, that's fun. Would this be implementable to cash games or tournaments or even sit and goes? If not, what adjustments should you be making? Well, first off, again, Tim, in tournaments, there is no rake once you're playing. So you should be able to play a little bit wider. However, especially in tournaments, especially in sit and goes, what is this on the screen? Especially in sit and goes, you should, um, you have to worry about the payout implications, right? Also, same thing in tournaments. So no, you should not be using these ranges in situations where there are payout implications. This presumes that there are no payout implications. <laughs> oh, you all, you all chat. You're all fun. Um, let's see. Are you talking about six max because or four max because live games are coming back? Yeah, that's it. I was inspired. I, I, look, I did not think four handed charts were going to be a thing. I really didn't. I didn't, or I didn't think four handed games were going to be a thing because, uh, well, casinos, are presumably not going to be able to make as much money off of them. And I know a lot of the nitty players, as you all said, really don't want to be playing four-handed because they want to play with um, you know lots of players at the table so they can sit there and be nitty. But I've seen some of the casinos opening four-handed. I see the Bicycle Casino, a big casino in Los Angeles, opening four-handed soon. And that's like, you know, if that's what we're doing, I guess we, we might as well go ahead and get ready for it. So here we are. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. You all asked me about four-handed games. Where can you get all these charts? Go to pokercoaching.com in the tool section. We have a lot of charts available in the tool section. What are the common mistakes other small six players make four-handed? Well, a lot of them are either going to be way too loose or way too tight, right? Right off the bat. What are some ways to discover their leaks? Look at the frequency of them making various plays, right? It's very important to realize that even if you don't get to see the showdown, you will get to see the frequency at which your opponents are raising, the frequency at which they are three-betting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And... Some people are going to rarely put money in the pot. Against those players, you should probably assume they just have good hands. And other players are going to assume that it's shorthanded, therefore they're supposed to go nuts. And for that reason, you can pay attention. If someone's raising and 3-betting and 4-betting every hand, obviously they're lunatics. If they're not playing any pots, or they seem like really nervous and excited when they 3-bet for the first time in you know 50 hands, probably have the nuts, right? Apparently no one likes this video today is what Craig's saying. Well, if you all don't like this content, that's fine. This kind of, take, take, this kind of stuff takes a ton of time to make, and uh, if you don't like it, I, don't, I won't do it again. But click like, click subscribe. I see we have a few hundred people here. So we need at least uh, a few hundred likes today. One thing you will encounter when you're playing shorthanded play is that inevitably, 
especially if your opponents are in there battling, you are going to experience bigger swings on a regular basis to your bankroll. And that's because inevitably, pre-flop and or post-flop, you're just going to be getting it in more often. I do want to make it clear here that, like take a look at button against small blind three bet. You see, you really shouldn't be getting it in all that often. You see this was is with a whopping, uh, what, 2.9% 2, 2 of hands, you're three betting. I'm sorry, you're four betting. So you're only four betting 2.9% of hands. You're actually only getting it in with aces, kings, queens, and ace, king. So I think a lot of people think you should be ramming and jamming it more often. But, you know, you really shouldn't be ramming and jamming it all that often. And, and you are going to realize that sometimes you are going to get your queens and run into their aces. And you're just going to do that four or five times in a session. And that's going to result in you losing, you know, four or five, six buy-ins over the course of an eight-hour session sometimes when you run poorly. So definitely recognize that that is the case. Trying to read all of your chat. It looks like one of them just disappear. B Purple, who was doing on Twitch, came to YouTube to press like. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. If you're on YouTube, you can also click um, follow, I think, and it'll tell you whenever we go live. You're not sure how we make these charts exactly. Is it the bunching effect taken into account by the solver? Yeah, this is with Munker Solver. And also, bunching effect doesn't really matter all that much when you're playing deep stacked. It matters way more when you're shallow stacked. Because, like, say... Say I raise the button, playing 100 big lines deep, and the opponent has ace-nine offsuit. So it's like not that big of a deal, right? But if I jam the button for 15 big lines, the opponent has ace-nine offsuit, they're going to call my all-in, and I'm going to be in bad shape. So bunching effect doesn't really matter all that much, but uh, Munker Solver does take this into account. Do you have anywhere the odds required to call a 3-bet with suited connectors, suited pairs, etc.? You often get 3-bet and find it's difficult to call. Well, you're really concerned with implied odds. Usually with implied odds, uh, you want to be getting about 10 to 1 implied odds with your pairs and about 20 to 1 implied odds with suited aces and suited connectors. Decent gappers count as suited connectors. Um, so roughly that, assuming the hand cannot win on its own merit. Now a hand like pocket eights doesn't need the full 10 to 1 because sometimes pocket eights is just going to be good enough on the flop. And you know queen jack suited does not need the full 20 to 1 because it's going to do pretty well. But as you see here, in this situation, say cutoff raises small blind three bets, we have to put in seven to potentially win, um, what, 20 in the pot, give or take? Yeah, we have to put in seven to win about 20. And then we can win an additional uh, 90 from our opponent, which gives us about 14 to one implied odds, something like that. So you see, we still get to call with some suited connectors that are very good, but we don't get to call with the weaker ones. Same thing with the suited aces, right? We get to call the big suited aces and these down here that are the, be the better of the bad ones. Um, and we get to call with all the pairs because we're getting 14 to 1. You see pocket twos folds. Like if you told me you wanted to call pocket twos, it's probably fine. Well, how deep are stacks here? 100 big blinds. And four-handed, you should limp more. Um, I do not think you need to open limp. As you see, the solver agrees. There is no open limping strategy. What about opening sizes? Do you think that will vary in four-handed play? Well, certainly some people are going to use... Um, much bigger sizes with um, their whole range, right? Some people in live poker just always make it four or five big blinds pre-flop. They think that that's what they're supposed to do. The solver recommends, as we see here in the directions of this, make sure you go and download this. This is completely free for all of you. Go to pages.pokercoaching.com slash formax. Here we have the sizing. These charts assume the opponent is playing the game theory optimal strategy, which obviously they're not, but it's a good starting point. So 2.5 big blind first raise. In position, three bets to 8.5. Out of position, three bets to 10. All four bets are to 23, and all five bets are all in. Okay? So that's what we're doing in this scenario. This GTO stuff really annoys you. You play on sites, no heads up software, and you can change your nickname each time. Okay, good. I mean, I don't know. Do whatever you want, right? I personally enjoy having more information. More information leads to higher win rates for people who know how to synthesize and use the information. I know that I have a way higher win rate on sites where I get to use heads-up display because, well, I use the heads-up display better than most people, right? And I'm certainly not even all that great at it. But more information is good for the better players. Less information is bad for the better players. So keep that in mind. That said, the way you actually beat the games with a lack of information is to play perfect GTO because you actually don't have good information on your opponents. So funny enough, the sites with heads-up displays actually highly reward the exploitative players. 
So if you think of yourself as a good live poker player, you would probably rather have more information because that's going to allow you to adjust and exploit your opponents better. I think I'm actually very good at exploiting and taking advantage of whatever the opponents do wrong. But I am not the absolute most fundamentally sound poker player in the world. I do my best and I study hard, but I'm not the best. I'm not spending all day every day grinding solvers. And I recognize this, right? But to succeed on the sites that have no additional information, you either need to play very few tables, which you're not going to make any money playing very few tables, just because you're not putting in volume, or you have to play really good, strong GTO poker, which you know I'm, I'm good at, but I'm certainly not the best at. In super small field tournaments, what's my opinion on chopping up the prize money? Read, actually, Google Jonathan Little, let's not make a deal. Let's see, let's see. Any plans to stream my live Sunday sessions? No, because I have to deal with my kids sometimes, and it's hectic and it's loud. But I did record one of them recently. It actually just went up in the... Um, courses section or in the classes section where to go up let me see if i can find this i believe it went up in the classes section mm, maybe it's in courses i don't know it's somewhere in here poker coaching's full of stuff i just i, I stream or I, I recorded a here it is play and explain full sunday tournament schedule i did this about a month ago i took a second and a third which uh managed to make up for the losses I've lost in the $2,500 tournament three times that day. But yeah, I played for 12, 13, 14 hours, something like that. So 14 hours of me playing online, talking about my thought process the whole time. To be fair, I wasn't like, I was grinding hard. We were like 18 tabling or something. Let's see, it's 15 parts long. Each part's an hour or so. So um, 15 hour long session of me sitting there grinding it out. You get sick of answering the same questions over and over again. Um, depends on what they are. Some of them are fun. Some of them are not fun. Are not fun. What are my thoughts on ACR bomb pots? I don't know. I haven't, I'm not playing cash games. Listen, right now, I think playing cash games online is probably not the best use of your time. Right now, cash game rake is quite high. Tournament rake is quite low. Also, tournaments are very soft and cash games are not so much. And I'm not saying that just because I'm a tournament player because I play cash games as well. But from everything I hear from other people, Basically, all the backing sites have had their people not playing tournaments or not playing cash games anymore. They're all playing tournaments now. And that's because the games are absurdly soft. So I, I would tell you to like not even play cash games at the moment, assuming you care about making money. How do you adjust to a site with no HUD? Like I said, play fewer tables or um, so you can pay attention on everything that's happening and taking good notes or just play really good, strong, fundamentally sound poker. Is there still more content to come? Yes. Is there a point that everything will be covered? No. Turns out poker's a big game. Ace jack on the button. Under the gun plus one raises. To two big blinds. Folds you. You call. Flop comes ace, seven, five. He bets. You call. Oh, you raise. Don't raise. I would just call. Anyway, you raise. He calls. Turns an eight. Check, check. Rivers a queen. He jams for 26 big blinds. I wouldn't even raise the flop here. I would just call, call, call. In this scenario, as it runs out, it's probably a call. Lots of draws missed. But again, it's a, it's a terrible spot to be in. Obviously, very exploitative spot, too. Like, these are not really good questions because if the opponent's a nit, obviously fold. If the opponent's a maniac, obviously call. If the opponent's fundamentally sound, it's roughly going to be break even either way. What's a program to track all your hands? Hold a manager. You are working on a video with you playing on TV? I do not know what that means. Did I just say 18 tabling? Yes, we said 18 tabling. Let's see. I don't actually don't know many out how many video how many uh, tables we had at this point. Let me see if I can load this up. One, two, three. All four, right. So five, it looks like we don't really have any more games eight, to play. Nine, ten, eleven. Only eleven. We right could play this. Five hours in. Thousand. Let's see if we go back to the beginning. Nice full day. One, two, three. Four, All right. Five, six, we are seven, back. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So twelve. We not have so, now so twenty six hundred dollar tournament up here. Because I knew I was going to be recording it. Million dollar guarantee day one. So I guess we're playing a multi day tournament. Anyway, that's what that looks like roughly. Um. Here. Oh, let's see. Also, part one's available for everyone. By the way, if you just go to PokerCoaching.com and sign up for a free membership, you can watch part one. What about cash on the regulated site? Same story. Rake is pretty high on those. Would Modern Poker Theory be a good place to start? Uh, yeah, definitely.
you deal with volatility in tournaments, so you need more volume. Uh, yeah, you need to put in volume if you want to have good success in anything, especially big field tournaments. Webinars on specifically note-taking. Um, that's a good idea. Where do you find these charts? On the tool section of pokercoaching.com. Sign into pokercoaching.com. Go right over here to tools. And here they all are. Four max charts, 75 big blind charts for tournaments, 15 big blind charts for tournaments, push fold charts, push fold app, range analyzer, progressive knockout calculator, all of this for poker coaching members. You're having a hard time on two no limit. You have good stats like 17, 21, 10. Uh, you're probably paying people off too often or perhaps not enough on the river. Like when you have decent preflop stats, which you're seen fine, um, usually you're doing something bad on the turn or the river, or maybe you're just like check folding way too often from the big blind or something like that. You want to look for spots where you're losing a lot. Definitely look at your uh, profit loss by position. That'll be very beneficial. Do you know anything about Poker Stars Pennsylvania? I do not. Which one's better, Hold'em Manager 3 or Poker Tracker? I mean, I've, I've always just used Hold'em Manager. I don't know if it's better or worse than Poker Tracker. You play 95% cash games with 30% rake back. I mean, look. If you're playing and you're winning and you're happy with your win rate, keep doing what you're doing, right? But if you're playing and you see that the rake is difficult to beat, then, or if you see that you're just having a hard time winning, you should probably look to change something. And right now I know for a fact that the tournaments are relatively soft. So that's it. I mean, tournaments don't fit well for everyone's life, right? I understand that that is definitely the case. Can a recreational player grind it out from the small stakes playing online tournaments? Yes, of course they can. Just got to play a lot of tournaments. That's really it. Play a lot of games in a game where you have an edge. Mark, for Holder Manager 3, go to their website. I think they have various tutorials there. Also, just search on YouTube. Do you like Pyrosolver? Do I like it? Yeah, I guess. You demand that I stream for you every day. Well, you can demand all you'd like. In terms of the solvers, I don't think I actually like the usage of any of them. I think they could all be way more user-friendly. But to be fair, the fact that they are not user-friendly makes them less accessible to most people. I personally, I mean, I, I have it on my computer and I use it, but I outsource a lot of the work that I do. For example, we had um, one of our poker coaching coaches get us about, what was it, 8,000 preflop GTO ranges we're going to be putting together in an app for all of you. We have a new app, by the way. Check out uh, Search Poker Coaching in the App Store of iTunes or Android. And there we have uh, push fold charts, push fold quiz. Those are free. Then you can also access your poker coaching quizzes currently. Classes are coming soon. And this preflop app with all of the straight GTO ranges will be out soon. I know some of you said that you like the implementable ranges because they're very easy. Um, that said, others, others want the straight GTO solution. So there you go. How many tournaments is recommended for a month? Depends on what you're trying to accomplish, right? The more the better, typically. Obviously, the more you play, to some, to some extent, your win rate will start declining. Like imagine you played 20 tables all day, every day for 30 days a month. Clearly, the win rate is going to be rather low, right? The six max charts, do we have anything regarding dealing with three bets from the cutoff or the button? You have to defend appropriately based on their bet sizing, right? To be fair, you can you can look at this, right? And you can kind of synthesize from this. Cutoff versus small blind three bet. You see, call, stuff that flops well, four bet, sporadically. But I mean, like I said, if your opponent's using smaller sizes, you should adjust this significantly, right? And I mean, in theory, we could go through and just give you the straight GTO ranges for everything. But you're going to find that really, like cutoff versus small blind, cutoff versus big blind, cutoff versus any three bet, really should be adjusted a lot. We already discussed how you can adjust this, right? If you think the guy's three betting a lot, widen it. And you widen it by bumping down the four bets as a bluff, and also by widening the calling range a little bit. How many big blinds per hour should you be winning? Obviously, again, the more the better. Also, big blinds per 100 is not really all that relevant. You want to be looking at EV big blind per 100. That is most relevant because he tells you if you're running hot or running poorly. It tells you what you would win if there was no, no variance. How many turns need to get an accurate idea of your ROI? Depends on how many people are in the tournament. 
if there's a lot of people in the tournament, like a thousand, you probably need like five thousand games or something. But even then, your your ROI changes based on the skill of your opponent. So if you're playing some small field tournaments against good people plus a bunch of giant field tournaments, you have different ROIs in both games. And the idea of I have blank ROI in multi-table tournaments is not really it's relevant, but it's not all that relevant. How do you just when playing PKO tournaments? Try to get a stack that can bust other people. Ah. <sighs> What adjustments you make going from cash to tournaments? What are big mistakes cash game players make? Most cash game players um, just don't play shallow stacked well at all. You need to learn to play shallow stack poker very well. It requires different ranges, as you see here. 15 big blind ranges are different than 75 big blind ranges. Go in there, compare them, look at them. That's all there for you at poker coaching. And um, whenever I get this tournament class out, we actually go through and compare, or the tournament master class, it goes through and compares various um, stack depths and how you should play based on those. How do you find an extra edge if everyone's playing on the same info? Everyone's not playing on the same info, Jeremiah. That's the great thing about poker. Most people don't study at all. Only a tiny fraction of people actually study about study poker and care about getting good. Most people just want to gamble. Are singles currently softer than cash online? Singles don't seem to run very often. GTO charts cost a ton. I'm trying to think how much we paid for our charts. I think we paid like $8,000 for them. Something like that. And that was just for like raw data. But then we had to go through and pay, you know, <laughs> many thousands of dollars to make an app. God, I think we've spent like $70,000 on this app so far. Just lighting it on fire. Literally torching the money for all of you. Hope you enjoy it. What percent of population do you think uses a HUD? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I have to go now. My wife has to go to work soon. Um, hope you all have a good day. Hope you enjoy it. I'm going to go lick my wounds for the $70,000 app plus you know $10,000 in range charts we're going to have spent by the time we're done with it. That'll be a lot of fun. The new app is great. I'm glad to hear it, Bella. Thank you for letting me know. Uh, again, you can get the app at... We can just search Poker Coaching. I need to have links on the site Yeah, so just search Poker Coaching in the iTunes or the Androids App Store. No sign-off from James? No, not today. He's uh, he's having a fun time. Um, yeah, it turns out apps are expensive. Assuming you want to do it right. I mean, we had a push-fold chart before that cost us almost nothing. And it was, it was fine, but it's certainly not good. And at this point, I want to make things that are very, very good. And I want to make things that I can continuously upgrade for forever. Right? Like, I want to be able to add this, the all the ranges to the, to the app and... It turns out it's a lot of work to make things good and also upgradable. But that's fine. I don't mind. Problem is you have to keep spending money all the time to make it better. That's okay. That's okay. You all keep signing up to PokerCoaching.com. What's the 30-day challenge? What's the punishment for not making the goal? There is no punishment. But what is it? Every day we give you something fun to do, to learn. It turns out if you're consistent and if you go through the content every day, you will learn to study. And learning to study and being consistent is how you get really good at anything. So again, there it is right over there. PokerCoaching.com slash tournament challenge. Check that out. Again, if you want the four-handed charts, pages.PokerCoaching.com slash formax. If you enjoyed this, please click like. Please click subscribe. I would appreciate it. It goes a long way to help YouTube know that you like my stuff or Twitch or wherever you're watching this. I'd appreciate it. When does the challenge start? It's charted on Monday. You can still get in it. Challenge started on Monday. However, you can start right now. PokerCoaching.com slash tournament challenge. Enjoy yourself. Have fun. Have a great weekend. Make the most of it. If you play poker with the four-handed charts this weekend, let me know how it goes. Is it better to be GTO or exploitative? Obviously, learn how to play fundamentally sound and then adjust whatever your opponents do wrong. If you don't know where to adjust from, you won't know where to adjust to. And when it becomes clear that your adjustments may not be good, you won't know where to adjust back to. So learning just implementable strategies like we have. Follow the charts. Go through the homework at Poker Coaching where I explain how to play post-flop well. Do that and then adjust to whatever they do wrong. Have a great day and enjoy yourselves. How do you do the homework tab? Click on homework. Click on homework. It's very easy. Right here, I'll show you. Go to PokerCoaching.com, log in, click on homework. It'll bring up the homework. Here is this month's homework question. 
study the question, read the question, go through here. Page is not sized properly for your stream. Then you go over here, click submit your answer. That'll take you over to the forum, log into the forum, and then follow the directions. Enjoy yourselves, have fun. I will see all of you again bright and early Monday morning, 9 a.m. Eastern time. Bye-bye.